Hello, this is James Reese, and welcome to another Razor Wire. Today we're doing Spotlight on Technology, and today we are doing identity management, privilege access management, everything to do with that kind of funky stuff around access control and, and how to manage that and all the rest of it. With me, I have David Higgins, who's the EMEA Technical Director for CyberArk. So thank you very much for joining, David. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Well, here we go. So identity management, he says, looking over at his other screens, we can quickly pull up his notes. There we go. Done. Um, identity management and privilege access control. So identity management, privilege access control, however you want to kind of term it, is all part of that access control function. You know, for, for years and years and years, we've used different methods to prevent unauthorized people from getting into areas be it door simple as a door lock where only certain people have the key um, be it combination locks for people to gain access to an asset um, you know so you know if you locked off your bike you could tell your mate oh that's the that's the key code I'm stuck can you go and pick up my bike all the way through to kind of like data center access control where it's now basically key badge systems you know, different people have different access to different areas of places. Sometimes you have almost two-factor authentication for that kind of thing where people will use their badge and then maybe they'll be verified through a CCTV um, feed so somebody can actually verify that, the, that it's the right person who's using the badge and it's not somebody else who's stolen the badge. <laughs> um, you know, and we've been, we've been dealing with kind of this level of access management now for a long, long time, way, way before technology was, you know, as it is today, was ever a big thing. Come the technological age, and of course, after we'd started building our operating systems and software solutions and what have you, and we were in the very early days, somebody thought it might be a really good idea to put some kind of level of access control in for, for people to gain access to these computer systems. And thus the username and password was born, which was a, a function and a format that a lot of people use for many, many years. But for, for a long time, people were experiencing problems whereby somebody would, would learn what their username and password is, or they would guess it, or, you know, people would use things like their kids' names or their by date of birth or whatever for, for that kind of, uh, you know, for that kind of password, which is easy to guess. Usernames were always really easy to guess. It's normally the person's name, you know, in some form or another. Um, and then came the advent of two-factor authentication, you know, to try and combat that. So not only would you have to have um, a username and password, but quite commonly you would have some kind of badge token or some kind of algorithm on a on a almost like a little calculator thing you had on your keyring that would then provide you with that second phase of authentication. Um, and that was kind of where we were for a long, long, long time. But technology must and always will grow, get better, become you know more ingrained in the various different areas of our lives. And it came, you know, a couple of years ago, in fact, more than a few years ago, it became very apparent that that whilst we were doing kind of okay with two-factor authentication, we were really entering into a realm where we had to really start thinking about, you know, our identity management, access control, especially privileged access, you know, hackers, malicious actors, however you want to term it. I prefer malicious actors personally. Um, you know, the key thing they're looking for whenever they get into a system, as we've kind of seen quite frequently over the years, is that kind of administrative access, that privileged access to the, to, to the system, so where they've got the ability to change or add um, malware, software, change, you know, uh, rule bases, whatever it may well be. Um, to gain them higher levels of access and further higher level of access so they could get access to the kind of digital assets that we really don't want them to get. I mean, that's a very kind of broad background of the technology. I mean, David, you're the, you know, you're the expert in this field. Is there anything you want to kind of add to it? Yeah, it's, you know, earlier on, you were kind of doing that an analogy of access control in the physical world, right? And it, it's, it's a really interesting one because it, the analogy works perfectly with privileged access and identity generally, right? So take, take like a military complex as an example, right? They will enforce different kind of tiers of access. You've got that kind of tier one access. You know, anyone can get through the initial perimeter and they can access certain areas. 
then you want to go to the next classification zone. Well, there's there's more authentication and more checks you go through, right? And this, and then you'll get to the really secure zones, and only the really VIPs will get into the secure zones. They've got to prove who they are. I see two FA, right? Their badge and their retina, whatever it is. And that plays out in, in, in the IT world, right? You know, we want the VIPs, the, the execs seeing the sensitive data, and we check who they are. But then when you think about a military complex, you've got service support staff, you've got the electricians, the plumbers, you know, there's a leak in the, in the secure area, the bunker. Well, we send in the plumber, we don't send the general in to fix that problem, right? The same thing happens in the IT world, right? All this sensitive services and critical data that we're running runs on IT. And who keeps IT up, or, up and running? Well, the, the administrators, the privileged users, they've got far reaching admin access. And, you know, a bit like you'd see in a James Bond movie where you might karate chop the security guard in the back of the neck with a bunch of keys, right? We see that the malicious actors doing the same thing. They go after the individual with a bunch of keys on their on their belt because it gives them far reaching access. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, all, the, all those kind of analogies to the past and the physical world really play out in, in, in the virtual world. Uh, because of the same kind of challenges, the, the attacker mindset is very similar. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, what we're seeing in, in more recently, right, is the challenges become ever more increasing. The environment's changing. You know, people are adopting, you know, cloud in whatever format they like, right? And, and, then, and of course, we've got the whole challenges of the pandemic. So actually, you know, verifying and validating people access wherever they are. Uh, and, and it's getting to the point where now people are really kind of assessing the way that they determine access in the first place. Right. Mm -hmm. Historically, it was this is your role and this is the access you need to do that role. Let's set that up in advance. So you've got it whenever you need it. Mm -hmm. Whereas now the mindset is, well, if David only needs that access when he's using it, why does it always sit there existing that it could in theory be exploited? Right. Let's let's give him the access just when he needs it and take it away. So, the, you know, the whole thing around privileged access and, and, and access management generally is is being reevaluated. I think as people start thinking the buzzword zero trust, assume breach. Right. Uh, it's changing the way we kind of consider the way that access is granted. It's become quite a big thing of, of you know, recently as well. I mean, we've we've seen a raft of ransomware attacks, you know, a lot of the time, you know, uh, it's people gaining access to those privileged accounts. I mean, you, you, you even have a whole underworld section of, of, of access brokers whose whole goal is to compromise the system compromise the the administrative access to that system and then rather than exploit it themselves they'll sell that to the the relevant groups you know they don't involve themselves in the the, the harsh stuff yeah. i mean it's pretty harsh them cracking into someone's systems and gaining access at the you know anyway but they're not the ones that are pro predominantly doing the actual damage themselves but you know, these are criminals in themselves. They're not going to sell access to one group. You know, they're going to sell access to anybody willing to pay for access. You know, they'll say, oh, I've got access to XYZ Corp. You know, um, if you, you know, you want the access rights to that, then pay me this amount in, in whatever cryptocurrency or whatever. Um, and then I'll give you guys access, you know, boom, all of a sudden you've, you've got all kinds of people crawling around your systems. And, I think in, this has played out a number of times. We've uh, seen, you know, ransomware going nuts. You know, it's so something we've covered a lot on this channel, but it's a, a real big problem these days. Um, and the other thing is, obviously, if they've got administrative access, what other kind of access have they put in? What other back doors have they have they put in? What other accounts have they created and 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 what have you? And given at various different administrative rights, because malicious actors aren't stupid. You know, they know that they're going to court if if they keep using that same administrative privilege and one of the things they will do is yeah they'll keep using it but they will make absolutely certain that they've got other methods of getting back in if that account gets found out but you know the challenges for security in in how you manage access management in a way and privilege access management in a way that isn't difficult to either achieve or manage because one of the problems that we find a lot with security is yes you can put in very high levels of security but the more layers you put in it tends to be the more hoops you've got to jump through in order to gain access to that system or that service that you need to 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 manage or or you know fiddle around with or add to or whatever you know patch whatever it may well be and you're absolutely right with what you said you know we I've been an administrator for years and years and years, but, you know, and for, for a while before I got into InfoSec, um, 
I was the systems administrator myself. And, you know, yes, I had my account and then I had my systems administrative account, but that systems administrative account was always open to me. And the other thing that's become quite big is also third parties, because obviously now a lot of people are using third parties for management of their server infrastructure, their endpoints, whatever it may well be. And those third parties need administrative access to your systems and services. But how do you validate how secure those guys are? I mean, that's another video entirely on third party management and how you manage that kind of stuff. But when it comes to the sheer access control, this is really where PAM solutions, you know, identity management solutions and, and technology around that space can really kind of help you prevent yourself from being compromised and in some ways being able to repudiate back to whoever that compromise originally came from. So, yeah. you know, are you guys seeing a massive uptick, you know, in your own um, research on, uh, you know, what are these malicious actors really going for, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you know, the, the, the sad thing is yeah, attacks aren't exactly on the decrease, right? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned before about ransomware. It's an interesting one because I think, well, most people consider ransomware and how to protect themselves. Access isn't probably one of the things on their top agenda. Mm -hmm. It's more, well, where does where's the initial intrusion? It's probably the endpoint. We need to protect your endpoints, and that that that's absolutely right. I don't want to I don't want to poo that. But if you think about it, you've got ten thousand endpoints in your in your environment. And one gets encrypted with ransomware probably unlikely to to pay the ransom right it's just one right? mm. probably recover from that if all ten thousand, well that's more damaging that's exactly what the attacker wants to do and they want to spread and how does ransomware spread well it, it, it's not via magic right it's it's via credential theft it's via lateral mm. movement it's via all the stuff you mentioned right maybe some some initial malicious actors got the admin access as you said sold it but, but that's what they want to start with there's all this clever stuff that happens before they even click that button that says lock out the system or encrypt the data mm. um, to maximize the impact. And, and actually what we start to see as well from our research that's echoed in other parts of the industry too is when you think about ransomware is the advice has always been and absolutely, of course, is, is relevant, good backups, good backup and mm -hmm. restore processes, right? Your systems lock out, well, let's restore them. The data is encrypted, well, let's restore it, right? We, we, can, we can protect ourselves against the confidentiality and availability, right, of the data with, with well, more availability, right, with good backups. And attackers are evolving, right? As you say, they're, they're intelligent people to be doing what they're doing. They're just unfortunately using that intelligence in, in, a, in a pretty malicious way. So, so what we've seen them start to do is steal the data first, mm -hmm. get to that point of sensitive data, steal it, and then actually start hitting people with a double ransom. It's like, well, look, you want to restore access to your systems, to your data? Well, there's ransom number one. Oh, and just to let you know, double bad news, we've, we've got your data anyway. We've mm -hmm. taken it out. So it doesn't matter if you restore, we've got it. And we're going to leak it unless you pay us. And, and then what we've seen them actually do is give the victim access to their server so they can actually delete the data and they can see it's been deleted. That's, uh, you know, and then that's okay, right? So we've got the data back and we've deleted it. But this whole conversation should be, well, how did they get in in the first place? How did exactly. they move around? Because you've paid the ransom to get your data back. But do they still have access to your environment? Because lightning will likely strike twice if that's the case, right? So, you know, there's got to be some consideration there. And, and, you know, that whole thing about the double ransom starts to bring up an interesting conversation about, well, if the ransomware is stealing the data, that's a that's now a risk to you as a business. What's the difference between that and just a standard data breach where they steal your data for other use, right? The, the lines start to blur a little bit. Uh, but the access, the way that they get there is, is very similar, right? It's, it's compromising that access to spread and get to their objective. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, malicious access getting into systems and fiddling around with systems or stick, is it stealing stuff out of systems is not a, not a new thing. It's, it's happened for many, many years. I think, you know, the, the whole ransom element is where it's changed because, you know, companies are having to come forth and say they've been breached now. Because it's obvious, because somebody's released some of their information onto a, to, onto a dark web page, um, and it's just a you know a, a, a different method of gaining you know monetary assets uh, you know from an organisation. But the principles are still the same. Did they get in because somebody clicked on on, on a link they shouldn't have clicked, or downloaded some malware that they shouldn't have had? Yeah. Um, maybe they did have administrative privilege when they did it. You know, maybe they didn't. Who, who knows? Or was it the fact that somebody has gotten into the system 
and they've they've exfiltrated out those details and then they've dropped that malware in at the, the nicest, choiciest possible part of the network for maximum effect. Um, I've always been in a big advocate of of um, defense in depth, but you know, with defense in depth, you know, the one of the first layers, I mean, to be honest, the only way to really protect yourself from that ransom element is encryption. Before Encrypt your own data before they encrypt it. But you don't want them running around in your systems in the first place anyway, you know. So that first layer is, well, how, you know, privileged access management, which leads us directly to you guys at CyberArk. So, you know, do you want to give us kind of a bit of an introduction as to CyberArk, what you guys do, some of the key solutions you have, you know, what is it, you know, what do you guys do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so yes, CyberArk Privilege Access Management, to, to start with, that's where we kind of started about 20 years ago now, right, uh, which is a reflection of what is the commonality in, in a lot of the attacks that we see, whether it be ransomware or, you know, disruption of a service, whatever it is, privileged access we see being compromised. And, you know, as you'll know from your system admin days, managing the accounts around system administrators has always been some operational challenges with that, right? So, so where we start is doing privilege access management, which is what is the most high risk critical accounts in your environment? Well, they're your administrators, your support mm -hmm. staff, the guys and girls with, with far reaching standing access rights. And so what we started to do in the early days is start to secure that, manage the privileged access, make sure that they were getting a privilege session only at the point of time that they needed it, wrapping audits and, and monitoring around that because a lot of players who, a lot of organizations that need privilege access are driven by initially audit and regulation. Mm -hmm. Today, more fortunately, we see people doing this for genuine cybersecurity reasons, but, but audit was the early drivers. So things like monitoring and, and tracking what users are doing was important. Um, and that's evolved since then, right? Moving into things such as enforcing the principle of least privilege. So if mm -hmm. you think about you know, your days from a system admin, the easiest thing to do was to give someone full admin rights. Yeah, I, I know your role is X and maybe I could give you granular rights, but I don't really fully understand it. So I'm just going to give you everything. You can do what you need to do, but you can also do a lot more. So you do mm. something accidental, there's more damage or somehow someone gets hold of your account, there's more damage. So, you know, the whole journey of privilege access is not just to secure and vault credentials has been doing for many years and rotate passwords on a regular basis but also really to strive to a position where users only have the access that they need, enforcing mm. the principle of least privilege. And, and that then evolved as well to threat detection. We know this is where attackers are going to go at some point. Let's raise the alarm if we see suspicious behavior, et cetera. Um, and then what's kind of happened as well is people have started embracing the world of cloud automation and mm -hmm. What was once a human task, right? We we want to build a new application. What happens? Well, we order a server from one of the hardware suppliers. About mm -hmm. six months later, it arrives, right? We then rack <laughs> it and someone then builds the operating system and then someone logs in with Amazon Access and installs the database. And now, today's world, the organizations are striving to position where they click a button and all mm -hmm. that's built automatically. And there isn't all that interactive access taking place. It's now a lot of automation. There's a lot of machines. So you, you, you're now seeing a world where there's a lot of the orchestration, DevOps, CICD, whichever phrases we want to use, leveraging privileged access to do, to do its thing as well. And that naturally becomes an area of security that we're interested in and helping organizations protect. Um, and then, then kind of lastly, what we've also seen happening as a trend is, um, is the definition of privilege, right? Yeah. I, I really struggle, and I've been at CyberArk 11 years, and I really struggle to find anyone that's accurately defined what a privileged user is to them, mm. because it's constantly changing. We see that, right? So it's always historically been the sysadmins or the database admins or the third parties. You know, you raised that's a really valid topic before. Um, but what we're seeing now is, well, look, the value of data is ever increasing. And so if, say, payroll is able to see sensitive information about what our executives are about to be paid, when they're processing the payment for those execs, are they in a position of privilege? because of what they're seeing, right? Is, mm. is the data that they see valuable to a malicious actor? The answer is probably yes, if they're a publicly traded company. I'd be really interested to know and if there's an exec's about to be paid their bonus just before the numbers are released, right? That's valuable mm. info, right? So what we're also now seeing is, is that definition of what is privilege expand outside the traditional IT admins and now also looking at putting stronger controls on the general access management space, right? So 
making sure users can get the access they need when they want it in a frictionless way, but still giving security that visibility they need. And that, of course, mm-hmm. is always the continual balance we strive towards, right? The right levels of controls, but, uh, but without actually having users screaming down the phone as right, that they can't do their job. So lots of different areas are covered there, but it's, it's been a continuing journey, obviously, for over the last 20 years. Um, and as I say, I've been here 11 and seen nothing but change, which, which, is, which has been fun for sure. I'm guessing actually demand has probably gone up quite a bit actually since this, you know, the first lockdown in the pandemic, because, you know, although it's a lot easier now, I, I remember many, many years ago, I worked for a, a, a popular financial newspaper. <laughs> um, and of course, they had journalists all over the world in some locations where, you know, you, you could barely get sat phone coverage, let alone anything, to, you know, and if they had a problem with their laptop or the kit, you know, there was nothing you could do. I mean, it, you know, short of giving them local admin rights constantly. And, and that, 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 that leads to a business, you know, business discussion as well. You know, I want to give all the journalists local administrative rights. Now, <sighs> From a realistic point of view, that's yeah, you can do that, but you're opening up the door to a whole plethora of fun and games that can come with it as well, you know. Um, and the, the the discussion about access control and who should have access, and we we've we've all been there when the you know you've heard about or, or you may not have been there, but you know I've definitely had executives turn around and say, well, I want admin rights because I'm an executive of the company and you do what I tell you to do, so there you go, because I just don't want any. I don't want anybody to stop me from being able to do stuff. And it's like, well, none of these people are IT people, you know, so they haven't got a clue what they're doing with it. They just yeah. want to be able to install something on their local machine. But, you know, it's still a breach of that access control, you know, and a, one little chink in your armor is easily, easily exploitable with the, the with somebody with infinite levels of patience. And let's face it, a lot of these... A lot of these people who are, who are operating in this in the malicious actor world have infinite levels of patience. They will sit there quietly for for months, you know, um, exfiltrating out whatever it is they want before they finally kick that 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 button and and ransomware you to death, or yeah. um, you know, gain access to your critical systems and shut your pipeline down, or whatever it may well be. And especially in you know, SCADA, government institutions, banking institutions, you know, critical infrastructure, I'm guessing, is one of your key kind of demographics for a lot of your, your customers. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, well, obviously, by the nature of, of who they are, right, they are, of course, clearly a, a, a target for um, the patient, as you say, well-funded um, organizations, um, who, who, of course, we won't mention who they potentially could be, right? But um, and we're starting to see a lot more regulation start to come and target those individuals now as well to say improve your security and mm-hmm. obviously access and privileged access becomes part of that discussion. So, so absolutely, you know, and you, t- you touched on some really interesting points because, of course, you know, in, in the security realm, what is our what is our role? Our role is to security to securely enable the business. Right. And now, of course, if you've got journalists, as you say, sitting in some dangerous areas of the world with no network connectivity, they're going to say, I need admin access because you can't stop them doing their job. Otherwise, we're stopping the business and we're not mm. really fulfilling a role of securing the business. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we see that all the time. Oh, I need admin access. Why? Because, well, I might need it at some point or, you know, particular instance. So as long as you can enable those people to do this, to do what they want to do without being a pain, without being a continual burden, then we can start to strike that right balance. Right. Local admin rights and workstations is something, you know, you know, putting my vendor hat on that we do directly address as well. Mm-hmm. You, know, you could have journalists sitting anywhere in the world with no network connectivity, but by implementing privilege access management in the right way, we can make sure they're not sitting there with admin rights. Because if they do click the wrong link, they do ro- open the wrong attachment, it's going to execute with admin rights, right? And that's that mm. foot in the door, right, that you mentioned before. So we want to make sure they're sitting in a position where they're never running as admin because people are people and you know, a human being and an internet connection is a is a dangerous combination, right? That's mm-hmm. that initial intrusion point. And so we can do things to make sure that they're not running with admin rights because that's going to be the initial intrusion point. But at the same time, we probably have to assume breach and assume at some point they are going to get through. And then, you know, to your other point about, you know, you know, nation states, the kind of patient attackers, you know, you've got to be realistic and say, we're probably not going to be able to stop them getting in. But what we can try to do is make life as difficult as possible. So they mm-hmm. have to be as noisy 
and disruptive as they you know we have to be as disruptive as we can so they become noisier in the network to give our mm -hmm. teams the best chance of detecting them as early as possible right a soon breach they will get in but if we start to restrict access not necessarily just from a network perspective but also from an identity perspective look identity is the new promoter has been the tagline at every security conference I've been to for the last 20 years. <laughs> um, but it's so true, right? If you can restrict where an identity can go, and we know attackers are going to go for it, well, we start to make their life more difficult, right? And that's, that's got to be one of the primary objectives, make their life as difficult as possible, even though well-funded, so we give ourselves yeah. the best chance of detecting them. And, and you know, that plays out in any industry, some of the ones you mentioned before, right? I mean, you know, especially at the moment, I mean, you know, we're looking at... Uh... <sighs> There's the, the the stats keep changing, the the rhetoric keeps changing, but I think it's pretty clear that the a larger percentage of people are going to be working from home now. A larger percentage of people are not going to be in that big corporate office now. Access management in many respects was a lot easier when when you had everybody working in the same office. You know, you had that certain level of you know kind of I don't know how to describe it, but or the words escape me at the moment, but you know everybody is in the office. So if there's an attacker who, who's who's getting in and you've you've solidly prevented remote access, you know they're in there somewhere or they're nearby. Mm -hmm. Now, through necessity of what we're going through, that's now completely changed. You know, yep. you could have your admin guy sat in a coffee shop in Hungary, connecting back to your systems in the cloud, um, and you know, having their their details nicked over the air. You know, somebody sitting shoulder surfing them, whatever it may well be. And of course, you know, we're all at home, so we're all using these awesome routers with awesome security that we all know doesn't really work very well. Even yeah. even even if you don't drink the Kool Aid from certain telecom companies that tell you their wireless routers are the most secure things in on the planet, which we all know they're not. <laughs> um, so what, tell us about the, the product, main products that you guys have got. How do you do it? How do you m prevent someone like myself from, you know, getting access to something I shouldn't have access to when I, you know, uh, or at least only when I should? Yeah, I see your point. So, um, and it's a great point. But I, I always, uh, usually speaking with customers, they always make that point about your, your employees are all set at home now on their eyes <laughs> provided routers. Hands up how many of them have actually changed the default router password right on those <laughs> devices. <laughs> Guarantee there's not many hands in the air. Um, but yeah, so so I, I think the simplest way to, to break it down is the, the what we look at doing is, well, let's look what happens in the attack chain. At some point, credential theft is going to take place uh, and then they're going to use that to perform lateral movement and they're going to want to elevate their privileges. So how do we how do we secure that and make sure that's less likely to happen? Well, the, the, the easiest thing to do is take a mindset of a soon breach. So that is very aligned to the kind of zero trust concept. There is, there is a request coming in for privileged access. Now, it could be from someone in the office. It could be, as you say, someone sitting in a cafe. It could be a third party that we've outsourced some support to. Or, of course, it could be a malicious actor trying to get into the environment. Key thing to do is we want to create a control point. Mm -hmm. right? We want to create privileged access as an example, creates a control point that says, well, before you get that privileged access, you come to the control point and you make that request for privileged access. Um, and within privileged access, maybe manage credentials for an existing standing account or the ability to delimit the deliver access ephemerally or dynamically, um, you know, if, if required. But ultimately, they're coming to that control point and saying, I need a privileged session. I need to do my job. And that, that's where we can start to do a lot of the validation. Has that user gone through strong authentication? Has that user got a valid change record that says they should be hitting that production server or database at this point in time? There's a lot of checks we can do at that point. Um, and, and that takes care of the kind of credential theft and privilege escalation because we're taking the credentials and the privilege out of the user's hands and putting it into the PAM platform. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the other thing we can do is isolation. That again, a soon breach, right? Internet connection, human being, dangerous combination, especially if they've got mm -hmm. admin rights. They've clicked on the link, something malicious running on their endpoint. Now, if we're typing, keystroke loss is going to get that, get that kind of stuff. But also, typically, those admins will be getting direct network connectivity to the systems they're supporting. So the other thing that we're doing is saying, well, look, let's isolate and actually do a kind of brokering, if you like, of a privy session. So we do a kind of protocol break, almost, right? So it's to say, well, we, doesn't really, we don't really care where the user is. What we need to do is make sure they get a secure connection to the PAM 
platform. We're going to validate who they are. We're going to validate they should have access to that point of time. And then we're going to deliver them in an isolated manner, a short-lived privy session to where they want to go. Mm -hmm. Monitor everything they do. And then once that's finished, revoke it. And then the user obviously, of course, has to come back to that process. So it doesn't matter if the individual's in the office, sat in a cafe in Hungary, as you mentioned, right, or, mm -hmm. or is an outsourced third-party supplier. Because in especially in those latter two situations, we can attest to zero security about the environment that they're in. Mm -hmm. What we can do is absolutely control the way that they get privileged access to our most critical systems. That's something within our control, and that's where privileged access can act as that control point, um, if, if that kind of makes sense. No, fantastic. I mean, absolutely. I think you make a good point with third parties. I mean, I've been talking to a lot of customers recently, and a lot of them are now sort of moving to uh, portions of the business to kind of manage service, you know, style as a service style items. I mean, with IR35 has come in, which has basically kiboshed, you know, many people from using um, contractors now in the UK. Um, so a lot of the work that they would previously be do doing has gone to these companies who've spun up as a service functions because, you know, Nobody wants to bring on potentially, you know, employees to do it. They want to push it out to somebody else. So products like yourselves, you know, or vendors like yourselves providing products as, as you do is a really clear way of, of protecting your organization against third parties, you know, becoming compromised because, you know, some of the some of the biggest breaches in history, I mean, you know, there's a few we could go over. I probably shouldn't, but um it's not necessarily the organization that has actually been breached. It's been a third party who have a lesser level of security than the organization who ends up suffering from the breach. You know, they were just a logical stepping point. Yeah. But with good PAM, good, good identity management, that kind of thing, you know, you can go a long way to preventing that kind of attack while still giving people the access that they need. Yeah. You know, so is this, you know, is this an automated process that, that, that you guys have or is it, uh, you know, inbuilt into your solutions for certain levels with authenticated access for like high level privilege? So you can allow somebody to do something that, you know, they're meant to do at the time they're meant to do it. But if, you know, your administrator is suddenly rebuilding an entire server set and they need a, an extended level of of um, access for a period of time, you know, is that something that, that somebody can then authorize and it, then it just kind of runs through your PAM solution? Yeah, I think absolutely is, is the short answer, right? Um, and, and with more context around it, right? <laughs> Whenever it comes to anything to do with identity access, I think of this, you know, anyone in IT security probably gets a little bit of a chill that, oh, this is, you know, a laborious, time-consuming process. So Automation is the key for for any of this to make it work, right? Not mm -hmm. not just for the security teams and all the kind of you know operational challenges that come with managing another security tool, whatever it is right, within the security team, but also for the end users. That the the interesting thing of, of privileged access compared to other security tools is, I guess, the interactivity from the end user. Right? It's very mm -hmm. much as I mentioned, a, a checkpoint that the user is very much aware is taking place. So we have to make sure things are as automated. As, as possible, right? If it's not feasible, if we're not allowing the users to do their job, well, they make the right phone calls and, you know, the proverbial stuff rolls down the hill, right? Um, to, to, to stop them doing what they want to, you know, stop security, enforcing that control. So, so actually, we try and do automation as much as we can. So that's a user working natively as possible, using the tools and the clients that they prefer, not forcing them through some kind of stubborn GUI, making mm -hmm. them work natively. And also integrating with other things that, that the customers already got, right? So if they're already doing change management, right? There's some, mm -hmm. some vendors I could check out there, right? Great products for, for the service management side of things. If an organization is enforcing change management process, then the user's probably got a ticket of some description that says why they're mm -hmm. doing what they should be doing. Well, let's just leverage that, right? Mm -hmm. Provide us the record. Okay, we'll query that. Great. You've got access. Away you go, right? You mm -hmm. want to extend it? Okay, processes to enable to make that happen. Um, so... You always have to be very cognizant. Anything to do with identity access management, which is a very broad topic, right? You've got to be very cognizant of the end user and their experience. And, and, and automation, as you alluded to, is, is a huge important aspect of that. We've got to make sure the users are happy. If users push back, well, then life becomes very difficult for the security team. Yeah, I've been there. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think anybody in security for any length of time has, 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 has seen that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, I mean, no, that's fantastic. I think, you know, it's been exciting to have you on the channel. It's been great to kind of talk over this because I, I, I don't think this gets talked about as much today as it feasibly needs to. I mean, it's it's a... I always like to kind of go back to the basic principles when it comes to security. You know, access is at the very, very start of that. But some of the most important things you're going to ever, ever, you know, facilitate or or work on. Um, you mentioned something earlier on about how the fact that it's, it's a big part of compliance. I mean, I'm a PCI DSS QSA. I have been for many, many years, and and access control. <coughs> and the component pieces around that, though. I mean, there's two entire requirements built around, you know, the logical aspect of it and the actual technological aspect of it. Um, so it'll be, you know, it's, it's I've utilised your product a few times to facilitate some of those requirements. And I think, you know, with everything going on in the world, I mean, I was reading about some stuff from Joe Biden, and and they're saying now that you know their their cybersecurity capability and protection around their critical infrastructure, I believe the words were woefully inadequate. Hmm. Um, and it's it's really you know any tips that I can give to uh, anybody watching this where you're going through a big infosec um, product project where you're kind of relooking at what you have, start with you know, the stuff that CyberArk are, are here to kind of showcase, which is your access management, your privileged access management, how you're going to manage that. Because if you are in a critical infrastructure environment, you are going to have all types of people who need all types of different access to all types of different parts of that, you know, infrastructure. It's all driven by software now. Be it the people who, you know, make sure that um, the water is flowing correctly through the piping system, be it, um banking institutions verifying who's got access to accounts you know or, or customer accounts company accounts you know on a regular basis that kind of thing and of course this type of technology is right at that top layer of that defense in depth you know um you've got plenty of other stuff that can come underneath it that can help support that function you know but access control by by the nature of what it is it's it's the right at the beginning right at the beginning of that stack so cheers guys i mean i do urge any of you to kind of um go to cyber Arts website have a look at what they do if you want to have a discussion please feel free to call through to us um or call call through to cyber Arc. you know if there's any questions that you have for david or cyber Arc or you know myself please feel free to chuck them in the comments um or get in contact with us through um the contact details that you see in the description um david it's been absolutely fantastic to have you on the channel it's been great to have cyber Arc as part of this and we'll speak to you soon goodbye thank you bye